you know the great thing about multi-part theories? They actually give me one of the rare opportunities I have to answer some of your biggest questions about earlier parts in the theory, which is pretty exciting actually. So last time we talked about how the mysterious Darkner world that Chris and Susie explore during the most inefficient quest to find chalk ever is all just an imaginary role-playing game, one dreamed up by Chris in an attempt to connect with Susie and work through their personal struggles. You can tell based on the fact that the Darkners are toys, the weapons are school supplies, and the story incorporates people from Chris's life. But that of course led to a lot of questions and counterpoints, so before we move forward with part two of this mega theory, let me address some of those. Question one, if everything was just a game, then what about Susie? Why would she go along with Chris's game? And then how do you explain her reaction, asking whether everything was just a dream when they leave the classroom? How could something imaginary have this level of emotional impact on her? Well, the thing to remember here is that she doesn't just go for it at the beginning of the story. Notice how she starts, metaphorically running away from Chris, ignoring Ralsei's prophecy, saying things like, let's just get this over with. She is clearly not into the fantasy elements of the story, and she's only won over once the fighting starts. She likes fighting so much that you can't even control her. She just attacks everything. She's playing a game where Chris is giving her the choice to act out her violent fantasies in a safe environment with no consequences. In the paper role-playing world, these types of characters even have a name. They're called the murder hobos, the new or reluctant players who simply murder everything that they can find until they realize that, heck, they can solve problems presented to them in a number of different ways. Remember, you don't have to take everything literally. A dark, scary closet can be symbolic of emotional vulnerability. And at the end of the chapter, her response is the response of someone coming out of a fantasy world, someone who was super immersed in the game that they were playing. Haven't you ever felt that way after playing a video game? Not knowing how much time has passed, you've let yourself get lost in the story. You're immersed, and when you come out, you're a changed person. I used the comparison last time to The Wizard of Oz. It doesn't actually matter whether or not Dorothy literally went to Oz, she wakes up a changed person. She looks at her friends and family in a different way, just like Susie coming out of this imaginary game. Question two, isn't a theory that says everything is just a game simply a lazy explanation on par with dream theories? Yes. Yes it is, 100%. If there isn't any proof that that's the case, and also if there isn't any narrative consequences to that theory. But here, we have both of those things. We have enemies that are checkers with legs. We traverse checkerboards alongside playing cards and stuffed cats, with characters who use pencils as weapons and random junk in their pockets as items. And it's all to tell this story about a socially outcast kid who is working through their emotions via an imaginary game world. It seems pretty solid to me, but as more pieces of evidence, notice everyone's fainting animations during the battle? Chris and Susie both take a knee while they recover. Ralsei, however, the only darkener in the party, completely disappears, leaving only his hat and cape. He's not real, while the other two are. Oh, and that whole opening sequence in the purple barren area? It's just Chris's imagination getting warmed up again to tell this story. She starts with what's immediately in her mind, chalk. It's what Elfies tells her to go get, it's what she sees Susie eat, and it's what she starts her story with. You noticed all those white piles at the beginning? Chalk dust. And look at that first save point. It already has Chris's name in there. This is a place that she's been to before, and she reaches out, quote, like it's second nature. This is a home away from home for Chris. We're told early on that only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. That tells us everything we need to know. We're not seeing with our eyes, we're seeing with our imagination. Question three, is theoryware still available? And yes, it is, thanks for asking. It ships internationally, and it comes in all sizes, and it is really high quality with all the patches and designs sewn into the fabric, and it has been shown in the past to unite fellow theorists out in the wild. And yes, if you do order before December 10th, you are guaranteed to get it before Christmas, regardless of whether you're international or not. So, um, yeah, thanks for asking. And finally, question number four. What about the egg in the fridge? What about the ending where Chris rips their heart out? What about the gaster connections? How does all of this connect to Undertale? Well, um, how much time you got? Because that is where the theory for today begins. Hello, in 
internet, welcome to Game Theory, where I gotta say that was by far the longest intro to an episode ever. I kinda liked it though, being able to answer questions in a follow-up format. I wish there was a way that we could do it more regularly without YouTube actively punishing the channel for an upload that is gonna get fewer clicks. Anyway, let's cut to the chase. Today we're starting to examine the one all-important question looming over all of Deltarune. How exactly is it connected to Undertale? On one hand, you have characters out on the surface, which seems to indicate it's happening after the events of Undertale, but then again, you have details like Undyne having both her eyes, meaning that this must have come before. So it can't be a sequel to Undertale, but it also can't be a prequel. Not in the traditional sense, at least. So what is Deltarune to Undertale if it is truly anything? Well, with all those options discounted, there seems to be just one possibility, that this is a parallel world, a more peaceful one, where the monsters were never driven underground by the humans, where Undyne never lost an eye, where Braddy and Caddy never became friends, where the Dreamers never adopted a fallen child because there was nowhere for the child to fall into. To anyone who's played Undertale, the idea of an alternate universe doesn't sound that far-fetched. I mean, after all, the central premise of Undertale's entire story is that every time you as the player reload a save file or start a new game, you're creating a new timeline of events. In one reality, everyone is freed from the underground to live happily ever after. In another, Toriel is left to rule the underground after Asgore's tragic death. And in yet another, everyone dies and the world is destroyed. And no matter how many times you reset, no matter how long it's been since you last played the game, you can't get away from the consequences of your decision. Or in my personal canon universe, all the boss monsters die, leaving only the annoying dog to rule the underground with his fluffy little iron paw fist. Every one of these parallel timelines exist in Undertale's universe, and from story elements right down to the game's mechanics, there is a significant amount of evidence to suggest that the Lightner world in Deltarune, everything that's happening at the beginning and epilogue of chapter one, is yet another iteration of the main Undertale universe. First, look at this. Deltarune has its own unique menu system, but only when you're exploring and fighting in the dark world. When Chris is running around hometown, the pause menu and inventory screens are totally different, but just so happen to be totally identical to the menus that we saw in Undertale. That could just be chalked up to a minor design coincidence until you also notice this, the text boxes. All the boxes that we see in Hometown use the traditional Undertale UI, with entirely black and white sprites talking. All the inhabitants in the Dark World, meanwhile, are represented by colored sprites. Coincidence? Maybe, until you also notice that Susie, the only other person from your world, has a black and white portrait even when she's down in the Darkner world. Toby Fox is clearly using the elements of game design to draw a connection between the overworld and the events of Undertale. We already know that the game mechanics of Undertale form the very fabric of its reality, as we see Flowey actively exploit the save and load systems during his final fights with you. And we know that those mechanical factors remain constant, even as you jump between the different timelines. So the fact that Deltarune's hometown also has those same mechanics heavily implies that it exists in yet another version of that very same reality. Only this time, it's a reality with one key difference. The war between humans and monsters never actually happened. The most obvious difference becomes apparent right at the start of the game. The fact that Azrael Dreamer, the not-so-imaginatively named son of Asgore and Toriel, can't believe it took me this long to finally put that one together, is still alive. Now, as a refresher, before the events of Undertale, Azrael was tragically killed by humans after escaping the barrier to the underground with his adopted sibling Chara. His death is the inciting incident for Undertale's entire story, giving rise to every major conflict present in the game. But in Deltarune, that never happened. He's still alive and he's off enjoying college life. Another change that really stands out is the difference in Alfie's and Undyne's relationship. Their romance plays a key role in Undertale's true pacifist ending, but in Deltarune, they don't even know each other. Remember those differences because we'll come back to them in a moment. Before we do that though, let's look at some examples of what doesn't change between the games. Burger Pants. Back in Undertale, our favorite high-strung register jockey made it very clear that he hated the underground, and that he longed to be on the surface where he would get a second chance at life and fulfill his dream of becoming an actor. So, I wanted to be an actor! 
back door! If Asgore gets just one more soul, we'll finally get to go to the surface! It'll be a brand new world! There's gotta be a second chance out there for me! In Deltarune, we see him on the surface with a new chance at life, and where is he? He still ends up working a minimum wage job at a restaurant where he talks about eventually becoming an actor. I can't slack off for seconds without hearing. Be a team player, there's no I in Peza. Yes, there is! You just took it out! But it's okay, little buddy. I've been saving up to go to college where Azzy is. Hey. Then I'll get a theater degree, become a famous actor, and let the fangirls roll in, little buddy. Then there's the rest of the Dreamer family. Despite living very different lives in Deltarune that they did in Undertale, Asgore still loves flowers, Toriel still loves kids, she still bakes butterscotch pie, they still adopt a child, and they still wind up divorced. Now pop on over to the cemetery, and you can find some gravestones. There's Gerson the Turtle, but there are three other character names that you wouldn't immediately recognize. So I started to ask myself what united a snowy gemstone mother with a leader of a pack of dogs and a brave karaoke singer. And then it hit me. They were all the amalgamates, the twisted monsters that had died of natural causes and then had been experimented on with determination in the true lab of Undertale. Snowdrake's mother, Endogeny the pack of dogs, and Lemonbread, Shiren's sister, the singer, all dead in this timeline just like they were in the Undertale timeline. Only this time they're not all melted together. So, why am I pointing all this out? Well, at first glance, these similarities and differences in these two games' worlds might seem Chaos. random, but there does appear to be a consistent logic behind them. The things that stay consistent between Undertale and Deltarune are the results of the characters' personalities, while the differences appear to be the direct result of the monster-human war having never occurred. Burger Pants ends up working at yet another restaurant because that's the kind of job he's suited for. His ambitions as an actor means he's gonna be working fast food for a while. Toriel and Asgore adopt a human child in both games because they're simply loving parents, and they eventually get divorced in both games because they simply aren't romantically compatible in any timeline. Their divorce was inevitable, and it had to do with them, their personalities, and not external events. The monsters who became amalgamates in Undertale all died of natural causes, which could have happened whether they were in the underground or not. But now look at all those differences I mentioned. The monsters are on the surface, because the war never happened. Asriel is alive because his adopted sibling didn't die and asked to be brought to the surface, which was a direct result of the war. Officer Undyne never lost her eye because she wasn't a soldier and never needed to be, because soldiers just aren't a thing in a warless world. In Undertale's world, she and Elfie's met because she was at the dump looking for cool swords, but as a cop, she just would never need to do that. Undertale's world was built around a repressed society in the aftermath of a bloody war against the humans, but in this alternate timeline, a world that branched off before that war ever occurred, the same personalities are left to find new paths. The strong-willed Undyne will still become an authority figure in her community, but instead of being a soldier, she becomes a cop. Just like Burger Pants will always be a struggling actor working the register, living out the same story, just in a different timeline branch. But back in Undertale, there were some characters, like Sans, Flowey, and of course you, who were able to travel between the separate universes and knew the alternate histories that were unfolding, something that seems to be continuing in Deltarune. Travel north of the intersection where you meet Undyne, and you'll find your second favorite skeleton standing in front of a grocery store that is clearly Grillby's from Snowden, with Sans's name painted over the sign. Next door is Sans and Papyrus's house, also ripped straight from Undertale. And this is already pretty interesting on its own. Aside from Napstabluk's house further north, these are the only other two buildings in hometown that are identical to buildings from Undertale. It's almost as if Sans took his two favorite places from Snowden with him when he came to this world. But that could just be a coincidence, right? Maybe, but what's a lot harder to wave off here is Sansa's dialogue. When you speak to him, you have two options for greeting him. Great to see you again, and who the heck are you? If you choose the latter one, nothing of note happens. But if you choose the former, Sans says, Yeah, it's real nice, isn't it? Especially considering I've never met you before. It's a line that seems to imply that this is indeed a new Sans in a new world in a brand new game, but notice that he delivers the line with a smile and a wink. The exact same response he gives in Undertale every single time he's pretending that he he doesn't know about the other timelines. 
So Sans seems to know what's going on, but that's expected at this point. Sans is an extra-worldly character who seems to be a master of time and space. It doesn't, however, explain how Chris knows him. It makes zero sense for Chris to say, great to meet you again, to someone that they've never met before. But it does make sense for the player to say it. Consider this. During Chapter 1's epilogue, while Chris is wandering around hometown, several characters remark that they're acting differently than they normally do, that Chris is more cheerful and outgoing. And you could chalk that up to having a good day and making a new friend in Susie, but it seems to go deeper. The nurse at the hospital tells us that Chris's beautiful piano playing often cheers her and the patients up, but when the player moves Chris to the piano and tries to play it, all they can do is play a single horrid sour note. Having a good day wouldn't make Chris suddenly lose all their musical skills. The difference is the player's influence. Chris and the player are not one and the same. It's actually something that's established at the top of the game. A mysterious voice calls out, Are you there? Are we connected? Then, and only then, the soul appears. We are there. We are the only thing that's there. We are connected to this new game. We are the soul that the game has been waiting for to connect to and thus move on. The soul is us. It's why when you speak to Undyne, you can bring up Alfie's or your past relationships with Sans or why when Chris rips their heart out at the end of chapter one and throws it into the cage, the player is still able to move the heart around if only by a few pixels. This implies that the character Chris and the player us are two separate entities. It's not just a last minute jump scare with Chris pulling their best Chara impression, it's Chris actively rejecting the player's control over them and their story. Hence the evil look at the camera. The fourth wall is breaking in an Undertale game once again. It's Chris saying, the character you want me to be is not the character I want to be. The decisions you want me to make are not the ones I'm going to make. Your choices, player, don't matter. So what we're left with is a universe that's separate to Undertale, but clearly related. And characters, including ourselves, who know that these bridges between worlds exist. So then, who's the one pulling the strings? Who is the voice speaking to us at the beginning of the game, looking to connect to us? And why? Why would they do that? And most importantly of all, what does any of this have to do with the plot of Deltarune? Well, the answer is that it's Gaster who may just be Toby Fox. But all of that in the finale of our trilogy of Deltarune episodes next week. Don't freak out, there's gonna be a decoding the story mode of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate that'll happen just a few days before it. Because, boy howdy, that game needs some explaining. Anyway, don't worry, Deltarune is coming and it's gonna come out within the week. These episodes just take a lot longer to edit, so I'm able to talk about it a bit more in advance. So make sure you ring that bell to get notified, and in the meantime, you might wanna brush up on your Gaster lore, so here's a link to my previous theories on him before part three. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a date to get my hair dyed green and red thanks to you all donating on the charity livestream. Thank you so much for that, by the way. Your support was incredible. And in the meantime, remember, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.